What we're going to talk about today is closed captioning. And I think we probably sent out earlier today a, some presets. Now, this closed captioning I'm talking about and the tools we're going to use for closed captioning are available on pretty much any waveform monitor that Tektronix makes. We have the 2200, the 2300, as well as the 5200 series, uh, 7200, and 8, uh, 8000 series. So this, these are tools that we've developed over the years. And if you have the data package on any of these devices, these are the tools that you can use. And so I to, to create the preset that we have in here, I do, if I look at the preset, I do have one called closed captioning. Instead of just hitting that button, I want to show you how I created this. So it gives you the basic tools that I use when I'm looking for closed captioning. First off, I want to be able to see both 708 and uh, 608 closed captioning. We'll talk about uh, what, uh, what those are if someone doesn't understand. Anyway, so the first thing I want to do is I want to look at this monitoring display. I want to make it larger so you all can see what I'm doing. So and let's step over here into that. I'm going to take this monitor and I'm going to hold down the picture button. And I'm going to step right there so the closed captioning is off. If I go over to the right with the arrow button, I can go down here and I want to make this one 708. So I've now set it 708. I can kick back over here and I could select which channel or which stream of uh, 7, uh, 708 that is. Now, well, actually, I have to go down one, which service it is. I have up to six services on 708. I only have one service on this stream, so I'll leave it there. Close that down. If I go back to this window, you notice I have a blue box. So I have a blue box around here. If I hit the select, uh, display select button, it tells me which one I can control. So now I want to be able to go to the top one up here, and I want to make it also a picture. And let's make it full screen so you can see what I'm doing. I hold the button down, come up to the display, and I want to make this one 608. And I want, uh, so I'm going to turn it on, turn 608 on on that one. So it's available. And here again, it's going to be the CC channel one. And you know, they call them channels in 608, they call them services in 708. So now I have, so now when I look at, so back here, I look, I have both 608 and 708 on at the same time. Now there's a couple other displays that I also like to use. So I'm going to cursor over here to this box here. I don't need vectors when I'm looking for a closed caption. So I'll go here to the status button, hold the status button down, and I'm going to select what's for the aux data status display. So if I go over here and you look, I can scroll up and put in different status displays, but I want the aux data display. I select that. Down here on this one, I'm going to uh, step down into that one. Um, bring out the full screen again. So I'm going to go under measure. And I'm going to go under measure. And I can select a couple things. This is a data list display, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But when I'm generally doing ancillary data analysis, I'll put it on this ANS data display. And so I can close that down. And when you take a look at it, now I have two images, each give me a uh, different closed caption. I have ancillary da uh, data status, and I have the ancillary data display. And with these four, I pretty well troubleshoot closed captioning very well. There's some other ways you can do closed captioning, and I'll kind of give you an idea how that works. But this is my general, where I usually, when I'm going closed captions to start with. So, now we kind of have that set up, so let's go ahead and talk about closed captioning. And so, closed captioning, obviously, I was talking about there's a 608 and a 708. 608 is a, is the remnant of the old analog days. That's when we would put it on line 21, and we stuck on line 21 because we didn't want to blank it out. We want to make sure it came through with active video and nobody would take it out uh, by setting their blankets. Uh, then we have this uh, 708, which was developed to be part of the digital 
uh, television, uh, television systems. Now, in, digital, in a digital TV, one of the things we don't do, we don't underscan anymore, I mean, overscan anymore. So we didn't really want stuff in the active video, so they put closed captioning in ancillary data. And so we're going to talk about how that works. So Congress came through, started this uh, closed captioning back in 93, and we changed it to the new uh, 708 stuff, and it's the first developed in 2002. And once we started broadcasting in HD or uh, in digital broadcasting, then we were using 708 through the airways. Now, one of the other changes that occurred is the 20th Century Communication and the Video Accessibility Act, which this act changed the rule. There used to be a rule that any TV set smaller than 13 inches did not require closed captioning because the thought was the captioning would be too small for the average person to read it anyway. But now they changed that rule so that any screen, including our laptops, including our, uh, our uh, uh, phones, everything has to be able to be able to handle closed captioning. Anything manufactured after 2014 has to be able to support closed captioning. Also, this act sort of added some new features. They started in 2014, and uh, now, now we have to uh, uh, follow them as of 2015. And this is we need to be more accurate. There were complaints that we weren't the what was being said and what the, te uh, the text was saying was not exactly the same. They want us to be more accurate. Uh, as the full extent possible, they like to say on these things. We need to be more synchronous. So when it is said, it is read. So they're said at the same time and you can read them at the same time. And then it has to be complete. So at the end of the, when, when closed captioning has to be able to be completed before we cut to another scene or commercial or whatever you want to do, get the closed captioning complete. And then the last is uh, proper places. You don't want to over top people's faces, you want to covering up other information, so placement is also very important. Well, all of those are visual. So the nice thing about having a multiple display like this, and I can actually, if I had Spanish channels, well, so I could actually make all four of these a picture image, and I have closed captioning on all four of them. This could be service one, this could be CC1, CC3 here, English and Spanish. This could be 708, uh, Service 1, Service 2, English and Spanish. So we can actually monitor up to four at one time. It helps you make sure that they all are accurate or all in synchronization together and showing now. So it gives you that kind of monitoring tool. So when we look at ancillary data itself, this is where we're embedding this. So we really can't talk about closed caption today and troubleshooting it without understanding ancillary data. So we have our Hank and we have our bank where we place it in there. And Hank falls with between the uh, start of active picture and end of active picture right in there. And then bank starts at line uh, zero down to line 20. And if it's uh, progressive, it's back from zero to 40. So anyway, we, we, so we have this area here where we're going to put it. In Hank, we're generally going to have uh, what I usually see in there. We really haven't seen anything else in there other than embedded audio. So our embedded audio usually rides in Hank, and then Bank is where closed captioning, AFD, and other uh, information like that would reside. Taking a close look at it, this is data. So data requires a data flag. So we have 0, 0, uh, 0, 0, 3 FF, 3 FF. This, when this, when a device sees this header information, it knows what's coming next is ancillary data. And so after that, then it tells it what kind of ancillary data, and that's just this. And then there's two types of ancillary data. Type one, we're going to have this data block number. And then the, if it's type two, we're going to have a SID, a secondary data ID number. And then following that, data count. How much, how many bytes of data is in this, uh, in this packet? And it can be up to 255. I've never seen anything that large. So, and then the final thing at the end of it is going to be a checksum. And that makes the ancillary data packet. 
Now, you know, think about each one of those individual packets and data there, that, that 255, is the equivalent of a pixel. So being it can only be about 255, plus the others about 230 long, and we're putting on, on say, 1080i, so it would be 1920, you have a lot of pixels in You can have a lot of them on a single line. But generally, as a rule, I like to put closed caption on the line by itself, and I like that line to be line 9. I'll explain that here in a minute. The last thing on the ancillary data I kind of want to make sure I uh, realize is that it is an 8-bit word. So we're, put, we're putting it in a slot for 10 bits. So what, how they do that is they use 0 to 7 bits is going to be the data itself. Bit 8 is a parity bit, and bit 9 is not bit 8. So if bit 8 is 1, bit 9 is going to be 0. And so what that does, you look, this is a sample of data. This is actually a closed caption packet in here. Everything is either going to start with a 1 or a 2, because that these two bits here, since they won't be equal, they'll either be a 1 or a 2 there. Got to watch it when I use my mouse. I use the, stay away from the wheel, John. Anyway, so anyway, so we got to look out for that. That is the uh, that is going to give me the data I need in here, um, and and how it works. So if you take a look, you'll notice it's just we kind of drop the one or two because it really is consequential as to what it means. But you can see this is the type one. And it's all audio data, except for just a couple of them. It's all in Hank. And so that's why they need that data uh, block count, so they know there's going to be blocks of data that have to be tied together. So it helps with the, 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 that tied together. The type 2, for the most part, there's a few of them that go into uh, Hank, but most of them go into the bank. And the two we're going to talk about today is uh, is the did 6101 and 6102. So this is our 708 and 70, uh, 608 uh, closed caption information. You also notice that uh, the did 61 actually means there's going to be some sort of text information. All these are text related information under that did, and it's just going to define, the did defines which version it's going to be. The other thing I want to kind of point out with ancillary data, ancillary data is put on before the uh, Y channel and the Chroma channel are combined. When it came up with SDI, it was originally based off of the digital recording machine, uh, machine. and so you had a, a, a track of luminance and a track for Chroma. Those were mucked together. But before they mucked them together, they inserted the ancillary data. So we have Y ancillary data and we have C ancillary data. So that sort of gets us down to let's start taking a look at how we can start looking at this and taking it apart, looking at the ancillary data. Now, this is a waveform. I'm going to show you how to get to it. Uh, I'm going to open up one of these right here, full screen over here on this side. I'm going to go to measure, and I'm going to step through here, and I'm going to go up to data list. So now you can see the data list is right there. And it looks a little different than what I see over here. So what I'm seeing right here, and also it's the same thing as here, this is the information telling me it's the start of active picture. So that's my start of active picture information. But right in here, you can take a look and see this area right in here. This is actually the ancillary data. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is kind of cool. You can also see that I have a line number here, so I can look at what line I'm looking at. So I'm looking at line 10 right now, or 16. So if I were actually to take my cursor and the arrow indicating that it's on the line, I can actually step this through some lines. And I want to go up to line 9, I think. And let's see, I'm going to go to the other video. And put, no, I'm going to go back down to 11. You can see I can start seeing ancillary data there. And this is my closed captions in here. And how you actually read this 
is you got a Y channel here, so Y data. I'm going to look at the Y here and the Y here. So that comes together. It goes from zero to three, uh, three FF. This is, and you can step through this, close this up a little bit so you can see it, and you can see how these correlate to this marking. And then when I get down here at the end, I have my three. Uh, so I have a three zero 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 three FF three FF. Then there's my did my SID, and then uh, my count. Uh, then then my data count here, and then this is yellow ones that are really yellow are actually the data itself, and then we have a checksum at the end of it. So you can use this, and this is a, a nice, and this is the way we used to have it, people to look for ancillary data, but it can be a little clunky to use. So what we ended up doing is going back and using this ancillary data inspector. And that makes it a lot easier to do this. So all that information I just showed you there can actually easily be shown by using this ancillary data inspector. So I've got a set where I'm only looking at one line, but we have a thing called a, a watch list that you can go in and you can set up under configuration what different ancillary data you want to look for. Or you can go over here and select it to look at all if you want to. And you can see right here we're saying watch list. I have this watch list set up just to look at one here. And it's the same one that we're looking at on that other graph. So you can see it's present. You can see the did and the SID. You can see it's on line 10. And all the information. And there's the data itself. You can see it's on the Y channel. So it gives me all the information I need to know where it is. So why do I care so much where the, what line it's on? And because uh, that's one of the first things you want to look for. You want to look to see if your ancillary data is in the right place. Like I said, it has to be between line 9 and line 20. As you can see here, here's a case where someone put it on line 21, and people at home are going to see that because that's an active video. If you have it for line 9, you're going to get around to the video switch point, which also can cause it to be corrupted. So you really want to keep uh, your ancillary data between those, those women. And the nice thing about this slide, I can also look and see if I have multiple copies. Multiple copies can cause problems. There was a story of someone in L.A. One of the dot three channels actually ended up putting two AFD signals on at the same time. And what this caused, one of them was set up to make it letterbox. The other one was set up to make it uh, uh, center cut. And so what happened is that the picture started bouncing back between from a center cut to a letterbox on air. And it did it for a while until they actually figured out what they had done. They actually put on line 9, uh, one, and put on line 19, something else. So they had two different copies of it causing the problem. And this, day, this display helps you find that. So now when we take the, well, we talk about ancillary data, and related to closed caption itself, as we said, there's uh, two versions, uh, 608 and 708. And um, they are quite different from each other. If you look at 608, it was originally put on line 21, and you had your data flag right here. The data was in the middle, and then you had a header here. So this was done in the analog days, and it actually stuck on the line. So if you look at the answer, uh, so if I were to take a look at the uh, I got the right one right here, if I was able to take a look at this ancillary data display, which is this one down here, it would tell me exactly where my 608 is coming from and my 708 is coming from. And so both of these are coming from ancillary data. If it was on line 21, this right here would actually say line 21 and tell you where it is. And that's sort of what it's doing down here. So you can see it. But the big challenge here is that 608 and 708 are so vastly different. They're different baud rates. This one's at 960, and the other one's at 6900, and 9600, excuse me. And uh, the other thing is, is that they have different ways they display. Seven, uh, 708, they decided to do text boxes. We have up to eight text boxes that you can have in there. Where 608 is just rows. 
rows of theta columns. And so that's a big difference. It's a different, um, and the 708 has the ability to change colors. So you could have a different tax color and something like for each individual person talking. You know, the background's going to be different. The fonts can be different. There's a lot of different things that you can do with 708. But one of the challenges is in order to keep this baud rate exactly correct, we have to take care of one small problem. We live in a world where you can use 1080i or 720p. And there are different frame rates. Well, closed captioning is based off of frame rate. So if a 1080i signal, my closed caption data needs to be twice as much data on that frame than on 720 because there's, the frame rates are different. So in order to keep my baud rate consistent, I have to send more data when it's 1080i than when it's 720p. And this is one of the big challenges and the big problems we run into is when we do this conversion. So when we're looking for problems like this, first thing you do is you go to the display. This is what I kind of showed you earlier. I can set it up my display. And I can set this up for multiple windows. And this is a great way to look. One thing also to note here is that my 708 and my 608 the character sizes are different because you can al you're allowed more characters per line on 708 than 608. It's another difference between the two of them. So let me pull this back out. So you can see the same things occurring over here when I look at this. And another challenge that we ran into with Tektronix, because we are a test and measurement company, we text everything and look at it properly. So now it says six, uh, six, oh, 708 had color capability. We looked at those color chips and set them accordingly. But one of the problems that started occurring occasionally, the colors of the font and the colors of the background were the same. And so we would show it that way and you would not see any colors. Well, other people would call us and say, well, hey, this monitor is showing it or this box is showing it. And that's because they did not look at the color bits. They just didn't even bother processing it. So in order to stay consistent and make sure we didn't have any problems, because we want to tell you if there's going to be problems down the road, if there's a device down the road that's going to cause it. So you notice there's a red coloring here on that text. Because what we're going to tell you is, for some reason, this text is going to have a problem on some devices anything that looks at color, because this there's a problem with this reading this. Not only do we change it and make it red, so if you ever use one of our boxes and you see red there, then that's telling you that there's a problem with the font that may not display properly on all devices. And we also will log that in our error log. And as we go through this and we're troubleshooting, one of the key ones that I use is this ancillary data. Uh, data status, and what it tells me here is I can take a good look. I can see where my 608 and 78 are coming from. They're both coming from ancillary data. Tell me how many services are there. So this is a great place to start. I can see that I have it there, and I can see that I'll have uh, service one and three. I mean, channels one and three on closed caption, and here services I have just one. This technically is wrong. If I have something on 608, I should also have it on 708. So I have my second languages here on the 608, but it's not there on 708. Another thing this display tells you, and I'll show you how we use this later on, but this little line right here, this data comes from the header information of closed caption itself. And so we'll take a look at that. Now, as I said before, when I use this ancillary data inspector, I'm looking to make sure it's there, make sure it's in the right place, and I want to make sure there's only one copy. Two copies of 708 causes problems. So you want to make sure you only have one copy and where the location of it is. And this is what I want to see. I want to see it on line nine. I don't want to see it on line four, because here we are close to the switch point and it will be corrupted. And so how does this occur? The main reason this occurs is I had someone call me saying, hey, my closed caption is on line two. 
what's wrong? So I had him go back and take a look at it coming out of his air server. And his air server, it was sitting on line nine. So as he went through his system, he picked up about seven lines of delay through his system because a lot of times there are converter boxes that are made by different companies that will um, add a line or two for processing. And so you have to make sure you get that adjusted out so you don't get this in the wrong location and cause you problems down the road. But the biggest thing that we see and get calls about is, is this. When people have to convert from 1080i to 720p, they cross-convert the video, but they let the ancillary data just go from one to the other. Okay, this is going to cause problems. You really have to transcode both of them because the header information will be different. Otherwise, it will cause problems. And generally, when this occurred, it used to occur back uh, three or four years ago when people were using air servers to take a file and convert it to the format that they're going to air. Some of those air servers did not do this conversion correctly, and so they'd end up with 708 just not looking good at all, and they'd have to figure out a way to fix that. But the challenge is, is that the conversion has to be done correctly. And how do you know when this has occurred and this is your problem? Well, I'm going to use this uh, ancillary data status display to tell me. Take a look closely. This is uh, uh, 720p information. You can see the baud rate here. I mean, the frame rate is 59.94, which is correct. And then also notice that my uh, 608 count is 2. My thing about 608, or interesting thing about 608, 608 will just send you 2 or 4 characters at a time. 708 is very bursty. This value of here on 708 could be different things. I've seen it up to 30. It bursts a different amount of data depending on where it comes. So the characters will come and, and burst. And so you can't really use this value here to do this, but 608 is a very accurate way of looking to see if anything's are correct. So if this is 720p, and now I go to 1080i, the frame rate is going to be half the rate. So now I have to send twice as much data. So this now should be four. This is correct. So if you don't get this, these don't match, because this information is coming right from the uh, right from the uh, the header of the closed caption, then this is what to tell you you're having that problem. And what will happen, it will cause corruptions, and a lot of times you'll get your, it'll start slapping colors in or doing other things, uh, uh, dropping the end space on it to get spacing issues. You just get some random problems because the data doesn't shuffle in correctly. So we talk about that header information here. You, so here you go, we're talking about here's the header right here. This is the frame count, this is hexavalues, so it's really going to be uh, a different value there. But this is the one that tells me my frame rate. 4F is 1080i. If I look over here, this packet here is uh, 608 service 1. This information tells me it's 608, that's the header for 608 service 1. And then here are my two bits, or these are actually my, my two of my characters. Then I have service two and then two characters. So I have one, two, three, four, six or eight characters, so that proves this is 1080i. If this was 720p, I'd only have two of those. And actually, if you can take a look, this is 720p here. If I were to look at this, I can actually go here and I can expand this out. I'm looking at the data here. I can use my cursor to scroll down, and I can actually find uh, this all. So I'm looking. There's 608 right there. It'll be back in a minute. This has a loop on it, so 
doesn't necessarily show up exactly when I want it. I can put it on this loop here so I can see it. Uh, I'm going to 708. Okay, so I got 708 there. And if I hit this mag button, I can expand that out. Did I hit? Oh, I already had it on mag on. Okay. So when you have it on mag, you can actually see all the data there. And that's what I'm looking at here. And if you look at this one, so you have this one, two. This is 1080i. Let's go back to the other one. 720, 7G. And looking here, you can see there is it's away, and now I don't have so that one there. Is, I just see uh, 608 there, and I don't have the rest of this data in here is 720, uh, 708. So I'm only getting the one in there. So it shows you there as well. But like I said, the easiest thing to do is look at the Ansoy data status of Linda to show this. And here you go. If you're like me and you get bored and you're just hanging out and decide you want to do something really fun, then you can take this information, do a capture, and you can decode the colors, uh, the, the letters. So actually this comes out looking like that. So it just shows you how many characters can be covered, carried on a single frame of uh, 708. For 608, I only had the, the four characters. And the other interesting thing about the 608 and 708, they use different ASCII codes. So if you go back and you look, this uh, 80 is the null value uh, for 608, and double zeros is the null value for uh, 708. And then the last thing I want to point out to you is that in closed captioning, you want to look at the, you want to make sure that you're on line nine with closed captioning. And the main reason is that once you get out of the SDI and go into MPEG, you want to make sure closed caption is the first information in the, uh, in the, uh, the user bits that because they're taking, they're going to pull out the ancillary data and stick it into user bits in, in the MPEG header. So if closed captioning isn't first, some decoders don't like it. Here's a better example of that. Here I have my uh, active format, my ASD. It's before closed captioning. And what will happen, some decoders will say, oh, if it's Closed captioning is not first, and so there's no closed captioning on this. I don't have to worry about it anymore, and won't try to decode it. And so that becomes a problem because it's not being displayed properly. And the best way to ensure that closed captioning is, is first in this file is to make sure it's first in your, your data line. So you want to make sure it's line 9. And then you, and then I put everything else on 10 and below and not worry about it. If I just reserve line nine for closed captioning, even though there's plenty of room on there to put other stuff, I just like things simple. Put it on line nine and then I don't have to worry about it. And if you we do need to troubleshoot closed captioning on MPEG, we do have tools for that, which we can talk about at another date. But uh, anyway, it looks like we're running right about in a time, but the last thing I want to point out to you is Tektronix can be a very uh, a great source of information. Long before I started working for Tektronix, this was a place I would go to to get information. We have some nice uh, data sheets or actually uh, how-to manuals on closed caption. They go into a lot more detail. They show you some of the tables and stuff that you know I can't do in a half hour. But it's a good resource. You can download these things. Uh, here's a couple of websites for it. And we have other topics and other things. If you really are thinking of something to troubleshoot in video, check our website. We probably got a webinar. We probably got uh, some sort of documentation to help you get through it. With that, uh, Mark, do you want to open up the line for any questions?
Yep, we'll do that right now. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. All right, everyone should be unmuted, so if you have any questions, go ahead and ask John. I guess I was so good at explaining this, there's no, there's no doubt in what I said. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's reaching for their mute button now. Um, also, Dan Stalnecker was on the first uh, WebEx we had this, this today, and uh, he made a good point. If you have the opportunity, if you have a 5200 or a 2300, that it's good to go um, practice this stuff uh, right away. And um, I did upload these two PDFs to a, um, a box folder that I sent out earlier today. So you guys should have uh, a link to, to that in an email I sent, and you'll be able to get the presets that John provided and along with the presen presentation slides that you saw in the first and second episodes. So uh, Doug Kelp here. I'm the uh, show guy in Atlanta, Georgia, and just wanted to be able to say thank you very much for everyone attending. And if you have any questions, and most importantly, if you'd like another topic for us to discuss, uh, be it audio or, or whatever, it doesn't matter. We probably have an expertise with it. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, doing this again in about a month or so. Awesome. If there are no Go ahead, please. In, in the old days, when we used to do a waveform, I can show you. Hang on a second. You could actually take this waveform and you could actually look at it. And I could actually look and see where my closed caption is by turning on line and having this turned on where I actually can scroll through my different lines. So I can actually find closed caption there but you can't see much about with it. And so, and to do this, I had to turn, get the close, I had to go into configuration and turn off the, uh, and this, this was stripping out all the ancillary data, the started active picture strip. So I turned that off so I can see it. And then you can actually see it there. And you can see the difference between, that's actually 708 sitting there. And you can see 608 is a lot smaller and then that is just the start of active picture and end of active picture there. So there are other ways to look at it, but these tools do such a better job of giving you an idea of what's going on, and you don't have to kind of go to that, which we used to have to do in the old days. And you actually can decode and figure out what's going on and what's wrong. 